Flight attendants, please prepare for takeoff. Stolen by Ehlers to Wheeler, back to Ehlers, scores! Kyle Connor has the Midas touch right now! Here's Patrick Laney. What a shot, wow. Exactly shoot, oh! Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets, hosted by Jets TV. Welcome to another episode of Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Your host here, Tyler Esquivel, joined by Jamie Thomas of 680 CJOB and Mitchell Clinton here from Jets TV. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode. Well, thank back you. Back to back weeks, right, guys? Like, holy cow, like, we, are, we are really streaming now. Just cooking with gas over here. So... Uh, starting things off, uh, obviously, uh, training camp on the on the horizon here. Mitchell uh, starts on January third officially. Uh, what are you looking forward to seeing through training camp? What are some of the storylines you're keeping your eye on? Well, hockey number one. That's going to be awesome. Uh, oh, can't wait good. to see that. Um, <laughs> plenty of stuff. I mean, there's there's so many options. I think for for head coach Paul Maurice when it comes to uh, the forward lines. Number one. I mean, does he just kind of go with what he? what he knows from last season in terms of let's say hypothetically Connor Shifley Wheeler and start there uh, just because, you know, you look back at the the summer camp, if you will, um, that led into the return to play and the lines really didn't change all that much. He kind of, just because it was going to be condensed, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of time. They just pretty much went with the lineup as it was uh, for that four game winning streak when that went into the pause and went with that. So I'll be curious, number one, to just kind of see, how they, uh, how the coaching staff kind of experiments, if at all, with the lines. Um, and then also, I mean, I'm also just very intrigued about how Cole Perfetti and Billy Hainala come in. Uh, it was interesting to hear uh, Kevin Chevaldeoff talk about, you know, those guys when, when they do arrive for camp, uh, just having been through the World Juniors and, and everything that uh, that comes with playing there and getting their game pretty close to up to speed. I mean, it's not going to be exactly where I think they would have it at this point or going into camp um, during a, like a regular hockey season. But the fact of the matter is they've played some games and they've played some high level games and that's going to be important for them coming into camp. I think they're going to be able to just kind of step right in and they won't be working through a lot of the hands things if you, in terms of hand skills on the ice and just getting their feet moving to that, to that game pace. So I think that's going to help them coming in. And then also Dylan Sandberg. I mean, this is a guy that, you know, we've kind of had an eye on for a number of years. And finally, you know, he signs the uh, the entry-level deal, and now we get to, to actually see him. So that's going to be something else that I'll keep an eye on. Just so much stuff that I just can't wait to start diving into all this stuff um, and all these storylines just because it's been questions in the back of my mind for a while, and now we finally get some answers. Yeah, exactly. And you mentioned Jill- Dylan Sandberg. Uh, Jamie, Kevin Sheveldayov, the general manager of the Winnipeg Jets, touched mm-hmm. on him in his availability uh, the other day. You know, what sorts of things did you take from that availability? You know, he he talked about a lot of different things. I think one of the, the main themes was just that how different this season is going to be in terms of balancing your roster and COVID protocols and all of that stuff. And, you know, Mitch touched on it as well. I mean, Cole Perfetti coming into his first NHL camp with actual meaningful games under his belt. You know, Vili Hainala in a similar situation obviously had camp last season with the team. But, you know, this this has to be a good thing for Cole Perfetti and and just coming into his first camp, having some, some games under his belt. Yeah, no question about that. And I, I think... You know, it's a quick turnover for them from the World Juniors. They're going to have to quarantine for a little bit and get tested uh, to start. And when they get in, I'm talking about Cole Perfetti and, and Billy Hainala. But I think the key part is, is no one opted out. That's that's the one to start. Um, and the other thing that kind of stood out to me for with Kevin Sheveldayoff was, this is a much different year for the Jets back on the blue line, right? There were so many questions because of everybody that was not there. Dustin Bufflin not coming to camp. The trade Jacob Trouba wasn't there. Now you have five of your six defensemen having been here last year. You got another year of Josh Morrissey. Dylan DeMello's here for a full season. Neil Pionk get another year for to see what direction he goes in. Tucker Pullman's got a full year under his belt. Uh, Nathan Beaulieu. So you have some familiarity back on the blue line, which is what you didn't have to start the year. And then really the only new face in that aspect is Derek Forbert. And Derek Forbert has played significant minutes in the National Hockey League. So 
Uh, does he line up with Neil Pionk when camp starts? That's something to keep an eye on too. So, uh, of course, the uh, question was brought up about Jack Roslevic not uh, coming to camp. And, you know, of course, Pierre Lebrun saying that uh, he, Claude Lemieux mentioned his agent, that he was asking for a trade. We'll have to see how that shakes down. And then on top of that, Patrick Laine. I found this was a, a great quote from Chevy, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. This, this could be his best year yet, and he expects him to have his best season yet. So I think there's a lot of positives heading this camp. They're, you know, they're they're wondering how guys are going to be step in a little bit. Sandberg is, we, you know, we've been waiting, like you touched on, Tyler. We've been waiting to look at this guy. We've seen him at development camp. We've seen how big of a kid he is. We've seen how well he's played at the NCAA level. Now we're going to get his first full camp here, and, uh, I, for one, can't wait. But uh, the fact that this blue line seems solidified to me is is one of the things I'm I'm pretty excited about. And then Kevin Shovel Dave t- touched on that as well. Yeah, Sandberg seems like a bit of an X factor, the the unknown. Yeah. And we know this is a guy the organization covets quite a mm-hmm. bit. And it'll it'll just be really interesting to see how he comes in and handles his first NHL camp, even with all of the COVID going on around him and all of these other different wrinkles that aren't normally a part of a camp. So that's something for myself that I'm looking out on. Uh, you know, shifting focus a little bit now. Uh, to the prospects that we sort of touched on earlier, Mitch, the World Juniors obviously continuing out in Edmonton. Uh, what's what's the latest there? Well, as we record this, uh, we have a couple hours to go until uh, Cole Perfetti faces off against Billy Hainala and uh, Henry Nikonen and uh, and a nice New Year's Eve tilt. That's going to determine who gets top spot in Group A. So, I mean, we talked about meaningful games, like for a pre- preliminary round game, that's pretty good. Um, I've been really, uh, impressed with Billy Hainala throughout. Um, I just think he's looked so solid and he plays in all situations for Finland, as you would expect as their top defenseman. I remember it was a couple of games ago. I was looking at the time on ice and, and Hainala was in and around 25 minutes and there was nobody on Finland over 20 outside of him. So that just kind of shows the amount of confidence they have in him. And then it just seems like, you know, he had five shots on goal in Finland's last game. But at the same time, the the setups that he's making in, in the offensive zone for Finland, just, you know, he'll wheel around, he'll skate around a little bit. He doesn't have any issues going to the net uh, from the blue line or anything like that. He's just, and he's setting guys up. One guy had a backdoor tap in that just kind of went off his stick a little bit funny. And that was set up by Hainala. So I've been really impressed with, with him. And then Henry Nikonen as well. You know, this is a guy that, you know, was drafted and, you know, we kind of had an eye on, but you know, Liga games happen when we're asleep. So it's kind of sometimes kind of tough to keep up on him. And he's been really good. He's had a, a real net front presence on, on Finland's power play. He had six shots on goal in their last game as well. He was tied for the team lead in that department. So I think he's having a good tournament. And then obviously Cole Perfetti playing on Canada, that's going to have uh, a lot of the attention of people. And, you know, he came out in that game against Germany, got three assists in that one. And then his line with, uh, at the time, Connor McMichael and Peyton Krebs seemed to get going in the third period of Canada's second game. And then I thought the the most recent game that, that Canada played uh, was probably, I believe it was against Slovakia, was probably Perfetti's best in that on the power play, it seemed like they really had um, the message of get the puck to the net. There's so much skill on Canada's power play. They just weren't getting the puck to the net very much. Perfetti's first assist of the game was exactly that. Get the puck to the net and then bang, bang, it's in the back of the net. It's 2-0 Canada. And then his goal, I mean, yeah, I made it like 8-0 or something, but that man, was, was that a shot. That was incredible. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's been a good tournament for the three prospects that the Jets have there and really looking forward to the New Year's Eve till the end of the, uh, the playoff round. So I think I speak for all three of us when I say professionally, I just, I hope Perfetti, Nikonen, and Hainala all have great games and they have good stat lines, but selfishly, uh, go Canada. Uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, like, I'm wondering, like, if Perfetti comes down the ice, it's one on one with Hainala. I'm like, what am I? How am I going to feel about this? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, you know. Okay, into our guests now. This is a really exciting one. This is one that you guys sort of did under the radar and didn't even tell me that was happening. And when I found out, I was super pumped. So, uh, Jamie, I'll let you intro this one. But uh, this one is a bit of a callback to the 2011 version of the Winnipeg Jets. That you know, Winnipeggers obviously, I hope will remember well. And I think these three names that you're about to hear are at the top of the list. Uh, right now, Jets Productions kind of working on the, uh, this uh, Jets Legends series. And I've learned, heard, you know, part of the uh, conversation, a lot, asking a lot of people around the organization about that first season was a lot of the chance. And one of the big chants the fans were working on was GST. 
And that, of course, is Tanner Glass, Chris Thorburn, and Jim Slater, who became uh, folk heroes kind of overnight in that first season here. And Mitch, you were a big part of that and got to see it happen night after night. But this is kind of my – I've clearly run into Chris Thorburn uh, during our travels through to St. Louis when he played with the Blues that one season. But I have yet to run into Tanner Glass and Jim Slater. And I, I, I can speak for all of us here. Tanner Glass is a pretty funny guy. And uh, you're going to see a little bit of his humor in this conversation coming up. It was a lot of fun. Hi, this is Blake Wheeler, and you're listening to Ground Control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, extremely pleased to welcome to the podcast Tanner Glass, Jim Slater, and Chris Thorburn, otherwise known as the GST line from the 2011-12 Winnipeg Jets. Uh, gentlemen, uh, just so much uh, thanks for having you on the podcast here. Uh, Chris, we'll, we'll start with you first. Um GST is like something that people didn't really like in the whole scheme of things when it was introduced to Canadians. And now you guys are being called that. Uh, what did you really think of that when, when it really started uh, at, at MTS place? Yeah, it was, I mean, creative and the, the fans of Winnipeg have, are known for creative uh, chance uh, throughout my time there anyway. Um, and that one, I think this one kind of tops it off as far as, like you said, it's got the history with the Canadian tax and um, obviously the first letter of our last names. And when they implemented it, I don't know if I noticed it or even realized the first time or the, after the first game until like Jimmy and Glasser, we kind of talked about the next day at practice. And I'm like, no way. <laughs> I paid attention to it and then it just took off. And uh, we were talking with Sarah earlier and it's just, uh, it's something that was part of our careers that we'll, uh, we'll never forget. What was that like? I like being on the bench, Jim, or like even after the, uh, even after the chant had happened. Cause if I remember correctly, it was, you guys were, you guys put in a shift and then all of a sudden this, this chant rises up. What's it like kind of hearing that and then realizing, hold on, they're talking about us here. This is unreal. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. I mean, every time we stepped on the ice, we didn't know what was going to happen. They, they didn't know what was going to going to happen, but the only thing we did know was there was going to be a chant going on. And um, I mean, it was cool. It, it was in the offensive zone it was in the neutral zone it was in the defensive zone. And uh, you know, it was, it, it definitely made me and myself played better. I'm sure it made these other guys play better. Um, and we, we talked about it earlier, but the fans are so knowledgeable in, in Winnipeg. You don't get a ton of respect for what you do, but we felt like we were valuable to the team. And um, obviously the fans, uh, you know, felt that same way. So it was, it was a really, really great experience. It was, uh, it's, uh, it's one like Thorpe said that I'll always remember and glad to be a part of. Tanner, how about for you? What about the guys and the, and the rest of the team? Uh, when they caught on, were they calling you guys GST? And, and did it catch on that way? And did they end up bugging you guys about it a little bit? Well, they were jealous. I mean, no one else had a chance that was, <laughs> that was uh, arena-wide. And, I, you know, I think it even got to some other arenas in the league, if I'm being honest. But, no, I think, I think uh, you know, we appreciated it. And I think the other guys, you know, they thought it was uh, they thought it was a bit gimmicky. But they didn't, they didn't appreciate us the way the fans did. So, I think uh, – <laughs> we, the guys used to look down the bench and it would be going down and we get back to the bench and guys would look back at us and shake their heads like what are they doing like what are they thinking here because they were used to atlanta right they were like you know they thought the stars should get cheered all the time and when we got a little bit of a uh, little bit of respect it kind of rubbed the guys the wrong way so i mean we, we earned every chance we got i'll just say that <laughs> <laughs> Mike drop, Mike drop. That's all we need to hear, Tanner. Yeah. <laughs> Tanner, you just had the the one year in Winnipeg. How, what kind of is it? The GST chant that stands out the most, or what was it uh, that stood out the most to you from that one year? Yeah, I mean, it was. We had to we had to call it there. It was a high. It was it wasn't getting any better than that. So I had to I had to get out of there. No, it was uh, it was amazing. That, that year was so good. It was just. Uh, I mean, I was, I was telling Sarah earlier, I remember being in that first preseason game or not playing in it, but being down in the training room and, and there weren't even any board ads on the, on the boards yet. And I remember, remember Buff just like blowing someone up with a big hit and the, you know, I thought the roof was going to cave in. It was so loud in that building and, and that carried on you know, for the, for the better part of that year, I remember just having such a huge home ice advantage um, and being a Prairie boy, being from Saskatchewan, I always had tons of friends and family at the game. So it was a, uh, it was definitely the, you know, the coolest year of my career and, and one that I'll never forget. And probably the, the best hockey I ever played having these two as linemates. So uh, really super fun memories for me. Jim, uh, 
what did you know about Winnipeg before you got there? And then the creative chance that went throughout that 2011, 12 season, like Crosby's better silver medal, uh, GST, like, what did you think of all that? And, and of course, what did you know about Winnipeg beforehand? I, I didn't know much about Winnipeg. I knew it was going to be a great, great hockey experience. I, I do remember I was telling someone I was going to bring my skis to go skiing. Um, up there. And, but like, what do you, what Cross skis country. Bring it? I, I knew it was going to be cold and like there was going to be snow, but I, I thought there was going to be some ski hills or like sledding hills or something. But they were all, yeah, the only skiing you're going to be doing is the cross country skiing, which I did do when I was there at uh, during the lockout. But um, yeah, I mean, just it was just entertaining. Like, I mean, I I loved being in that city. Um, you know, especially around hockey season. Um, it was, it was great driving down the street to into the town, you know, coming into the MTS place, you knew you were going to have a sold out building every night. You knew you were going to have fans, uh, um, cheering for you. Uh, it was just a great experience. I mean, uh, what they had, I mean, hilarious. Um, and you look over at the visiting team bench and they'd be chuckling too. So it was just, uh, we were, we were entertainers and, in the building the fans were entertaining it was just an it was an entertainment for for the city of winnipeg and it was it was great to be a part of chris you were in winnipeg uh, through the 16 17 season and then obviously uh you go up to st louis win the stanley cup congrats once again on that um nice. but do you uh still keep in touch with uh, a number of people in winnipeg i know your family was uh quite connected to the community yeah, we do. Uh, there's a, there's a few people that we still keep in contact with. Obviously, created some really cool uh, relationships, uh, not only at the rink or around the arena, but uh, also outside of it. Uh, my son, he was older. He's an older kid um, compared to everyone else on the team, so he had already started school, um, which a lot of uh, players they didn't have kids that were enrolled in schools yet. So, with teachers, we still keep in contact with, and uh, and yeah, just relationships that just like the us hockey players, uh, ones that'll last forever and. Uh, they were big. They were as big of a part of uh, our lives as uh, you know the hockey team was because uh, you know we we need some services that were important to us, and they were there and uh, helped us through some tough times. Tanner, I was talking to Tim Stapleton a little while back about that first year, and uh, one of the funnier stories he told me was that uh, Blake Wheeler wasn't a very good loser when it came to video games and <laughs> ruining him that first year. Uh, we all know how surly wheels can be sometimes, but what was he like in, in that type of situation when it got competitive outside of the rink? Well, I didn't think he – he was one of the guys who didn't like the GST chant. He, you know, he thought he just <laughs> was there, was there, was there he, was, he got a little prickly, so – I, mean, I wasn't a big gamer, so I don't know. I don't know the wheels of the video games, but I remember him one day after one of those. You know, I think we had a he must have played fourteen or fifteen minutes, and the rink was 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 giving her the GST the night before. He came in the next day, and he's like, "We gotta, we gotta talk about this. Like, what's going on? Why do they keep doing this? Like, this is ridiculous. You guys were minus one or something. You know, he's trying to give us all the reasons why they shouldn't be cheering for us, but but the real fans knew, and we knew why we we are in those chants. <laughs> Wheeler did eventually get his get his chant. I think it was this past season when he when he became the franchise leader in points. So he got he got that anyways. He's, I guess he just had to wait a little bit longer than you guys. Well, he didn't earn uh, it until this year, probably. We earned it right away. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just Wheels, Wheels is a great player. He, he deserves all the chance he gets. But I do remember him getting a little prickly on the GST chant. <laughs> Uh, Jim, we talked uh, earlier, um, I think it was about a year ago, you were going into your first uh, season working with Michigan State, and then you are, you were also doing some work with with uh, the Caps in terms of player development. Tanner Glass, uh, you as well, did some some player development work with the Rangers. What's that kind of transition like going from being a player to now you're working with uh, with the young guys and teaching them what it takes to be a pro? Well, it's, it's definitely being on – different being on this side of uh... – you know, the ice than, than on it, but, you know, player development is actually a, a, a really cool uh, role. I mean, as you get older in the game, you know, you start, uh, you know, helping the younger guys out and it's basically just being a consultant and, you know, for myself, for Thorbs, for Glasser, like when we were coming in the league, we didn't, we didn't have player development guys. Uh, you know, I remember stepping into the locker room with, you know, you know, older guys and you see stuff in their game that they have to, to change or, or adapt to, to, to play at the next level. And it's, uh, you know, I, I haven't had the reward yet of, you know, some guys I work with, you know, playing in the NHL. Um, but, 
you know, as the years come by and you and you grow relationships with these players that are, are trying to make their dreams come true, trying to do what we, uh, you know, what, what we accomplished is, 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 is really the job. Gentlemen, we really appreciate your time. Uh, I know you're going to be contacted a lot throughout this uh, 10th anniversary of a season for the Winnipeg Jets. Uh, thank you so much for stopping by. Uh, Merry Christmas and happy holidays to you and your families. Uh, I don't know if you guys have one last message to Jets fans before we let you go. I'll let us, uh, Thorbs will let you start first. Well, first off, thank you uh, for my, our experience there. I think we could all say the same things, how much we loved it, enjoyed it, and uh, how big of a part of our life it's become. And especially now that we're done playing, looking back on those years, uh, very special times and memories that we uh, developed both on and off the ice. And playing for an organization like the Winnipeg Jets was uh, was truly special. So um, thank you to everyone. Uh, congratulations on 10 years, and uh, go Jets, go. I, I would echo, echo that with Thorbs. I mean, it was – it was such a special time you know, for me being from Saskatchewan. It was, it was really cool to play close to home and, and to, to be part of bringing hockey back to the prairies. So um, nothing but fond memories. I want to thank you know, Mr. Chipman for bringing, bringing me into that really special year and, and everyone at the Jets. I mean, great staff, great people around the whole organization. And uh, I was really proud to be a part of it. So congratulations on 10 years and go Jets go. Jim? Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's hard to believe that it's been 10 years. Um, you know, playing there for four of those 10 years was, it was a wonderful experience for myself, my family. Um, just had a just a fantastic time. I I I, I love the city. I love I love the team. Whatever the team's on, I try to try to catch some of the some of the games. And um, it's just it's a lot of fun seeing everybody. The organization was great from from Mark Shipman on down. Um, they run a classy organization. You guys are gonna be good for for a lot of years. And uh, looking forward to hopefully one day. Uh, you know, having you guys win a, win a championship. So um, all the best to everybody in Winnipeg and keep supporting the Jets. Shop where the players shop. Jets gear and truenorthshop.com are your authentic team stores. Make sure to stock up on all your favorite Winnipeg Jets and Manitoba Moose merchandise today. Visit one of the five Jets gear locations or shop online at truenorthshop.com. Thank you very much to the GST line for joining us. Just a, one personal anecdote. I actually have a Tanner Glass jersey hanging in my closet. <laughs> I bought it back in 2011, and I was, yeah, I think, chirped pretty mercilessly for it. To like, why are you getting Tanner Glass? But, you know, why not? He's obviously a hilarious guy, and I'm glad I did it. So I stand by that purchase. There you go. It's about character, not production. Exactly. And you know what? He had a cool haircut back in the day, and, you know, I, was, I wanted that haircut. I, I had the haircut. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. I've gotten too deep into this. Uh, speaking of getting deep, Andrew Kopp is somebody that always is a, a long thinker and somebody who provokes thoughts. And, you know, if you want to have a conversation with him pretty much on any topic, especially Wolverine Michigan football. Uh, but Mitch, he did a, a Zoom availability with the, with the assembled media uh, the other day. You know, what did you take away from him? Obviously, he, he's somebody that, you know, was part of the negotiating committee when it comes to the new season that we're about to start here. Um, you know, he's, he's a guy that's just been really involved. He's looking for, you know, more each year and he's proved himself in the opportunities he's been given. So, you know, what were the things that you took out of his availability? Yeah, I believe the Jets were the only team that had two people involved in that. It was Cop and Scheif, uh on the Jets side of things. So that's I think that's a pretty interesting like feather in the cap, especially given how close uh, Cop and Shifley are. Um, but also, I think with Andrew Cop, one of the things that he said that, that stood out to me was just the fact that now that he's done this a couple of times, I mean, he was part of the another committee in the summer uh, that was a big part of getting things back uh, back going again. Um, he says like anything, and I'd imagine it's the same for a lot of people in, in any sort of uh, context like this. Now that he's gone through it a couple of times, he feels more experienced and it almost kind of pushes him to do more of it, you know, whenever these types of situations, you know, come up, you know, hopefully, you know, not a pandemic or anything, but the next time that, you know, negotiations come or whatever, he feels it's something that, you know, he can contribute to better than, you know, just being a guy in the room or, or providing, a, you know, some uh, opinions here and there, you know, he's been through it a couple of times now. He, he can offer the, a little bit more of an educated or experienced opinion. And he really looked at uh, Ron Hainsey as a guy that, I mean, Jets fans will remember that name as a guy that, you know, he was, he was involved in a lot of these negotiations. And now it was almost like when Ron spoke in that room, everybody was like, okay, like we got to listen here. So I think it would be curious. And I think Andrew Kopp, you know, given, you know, like you said, how much, how educated he really is and, and a lot of the things that he can talk about. I think this could definitely be something that he takes on. But on the hockey side of things, 
you know, an interesting question posed to him just about the fact that, you know, at the end of the last season, uh, he, you know, said, I really want to take that second line center role. And um, obviously the Jets bring in Paul Stastny and he was asked for his reaction to that. And he said, and he said listen, like Paul's a great guy and great player. So it's not like, you know, I'm going to be mad at Paul or mad at anybody about it. He just said, I have to continue working to get better and to get into that spot. So he kind of spent uh, a lot of the the months of the off season here, working on the things that make him a good player, you know, those battles along the boards, pulling pucks off, and then also just trying to improve his offensive capabilities in front of the net, finishing it off. He had a couple of goals in the qualifying round. Um, the thing that always stands out to me in terms of how far he's kind of come is the backhand saucer pass to Kyle Connor against the Chicago Blackhawks. I think that shows that that offensive side of his game is there. Uh, it's just something that, that he continues to work on. So those are probably the two big things that stood out, but I'm looking forward to seeing what next steps Andrew Kopp takes uh, this season, regardless of what position he plays. Speaking of next steps, uh, as we record this podcast, it is 2020 and the world is in a flaming uh, pile around us, but 2021, the flames go out and things start anew. So uh, in that uh, topic, uh, boys, I figured I'd pose the question to all three of us. You know, mm. what was your favorite moment of 2020? And it doesn't have to be Jets related, but I think that's probably what our listeners are looking for. Uh, I'll start with myself. I think for me, it was the experience of being inside the bubble. I, I think that just that whole experience it was a moment in and of itself. You know, the fact that, you know, personally, I was one of a handful of people allowed in the rink watching hockey games and just realizing what a Herculean effort it was to pull that off and to get all of the teams that needed to be there on board and putting all the protocols in, you know, it, it didn't just take buy-in from the players. It took buy-in from the staff, from the city of Edmonton, the province of Alberta and, and everything in between just to pull it off. So I think while, you know, that this year proposed many, many challenges, it showed that, you know, we as a, a human race and as a society can really, you know, jump to the occasion and rise to the occasion and, and show that what we are made of as a people. So uh, I thought the, the bubble experience was sort of a microcosm of that, but uh, enough about me, Mitchell, what was your 2020 highlight? Well, it was interesting. Cause I was thinking about this question and I was like, Oh man, heritage classic was great. And then there was this overtime win against, uh, against Vegas. And then I was like, that's both 2019. <laughs> uh, that's just how long ago it was, but I guess jet related, I think it would have to be um, the game against the Toronto Maple Leafs in Toronto, uh, the Blake Wheeler helmet shootout celebration. I think that was in 2020. It would probably have to be that just because of the hair pulling overtime that resulted because of that game. And I remember being down by the, the dressing room, getting ready for post game jets were still leading the game by one. And then you you're watching it on the broadcast uh, TVs that are down there and then all the, which has a little bit of a delay. And then all of a sudden you hear the Toronto goal horn and you're like, that's the goal horn, not the end of the period horn. And we were tied. We're going to overtime. So that was, uh, that's probably my favorite jet moment. And just the fact that we got out of there with a, with a win after that, um, off the ice, I would say for me, I've really like a lot of people, I think gotten into, uh, cooking, over the course of the the pause and then the restart and the subsequent off season. So for our, for my fifth anniversary with uh, Callie, my wife, I attempted for the first time a beef Wellington came out perfect. Mm. And oddly <laughs> enough, I tried yourself. to do it again a couple of weeks ago and didn't fail miserably, but let's just say we had to reheat it a little bit. Um, <laughs> so I would say those two things. And then, Lastly, I think the announcement of the uh, the viable vaccines will be something that I remember a lot. Just, I remember, you know, the one being uh, good to go in Canada and I just being like, whoa, like all of a sudden that light at the end of the tunnel just became a little bit more real, you know. So a uh, big shout out to the the science community for being able to, you know, put put a number seemingly of viable vaccines together that uh, are going to be one of the reasons that we get out of this. So uh, those are my three things I would say. Exactly. And, and just a quick note on that Toronto Maple Leafs game. I think one of the reasons that thing, that game sticks out so much in our memories is because the time before that we were in Toronto to play the Toronto Maple Leafs, 
the Winnipeg Jets blew a, what was it? A three goal lead in the third period. And we lost as a team. Yes. So I think that was another reason why that <laughs> victory just, it was that much more sweeter. So yes. uh, Jamie yourself, 2020, what sticks out in your mind? Well, I, I, there's so many places to go, like Mitch said, and I imagine you feel the same way, but I, the fact that all the four major pro sports pulled these things off. And I know that baseball got off to a slow start. There's the argument between the players and, and ownership about how long the season should be and how much they should be paid. And it was it kind of got ugly in a, in a public forum, which didn't look good for anybody considering that everything was going on around the world. But then they got on the field uh, then there was a Miami Marlins situation got really bad and then everyone's going, they got to shut it down. And then baseball, all everyone bought in and it, it, it went off without a hitch. And of course the Dodgers win the world series is huge for me as a Dodgers fan for a long time. That was special. And then hockey, the bubble, how they pulled that off and the, and the national basketball association doing what they did. It wasn't easy for everybody. It wasn't easy for the guys that went the distance for the Lakers. It wasn't easy for the lightning. Uh, and certainly uh, the national hockey league, uh, pulling it off as well. Right. So I think the resilience shown by the pro sports, the national football league <laughs> going off the rails a little bit too, with the Baltimore Ravens the games on Monday. No, it's on Tuesday. No, it's Wednesday. Like we haven't, there's literally been a game played on every day of the week in the national football league this year. Never that that's never happened before either. So I just, the, the blank space that we had with no sports was hard. We watched a lot of games that uh, you hadn't seen in a long time. I watched the 87 Canada cup, all three games against the Soviet union. Uh, and then it, that gets old real fast. So the fact that sports got back on track uh, says a lot about both the, the ownership groups and the players themselves and their respective leagues. Uh, we have sports again, we're having fun watching it again and we have memories because of it. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of personal things in there, but we're, we're working again and uh, we have an upcoming NHL season. So uh, because of the efforts from the players and the ownership owner, owners uh, in the national hockey league. So that stands out for me guys for 2020. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much for doing this today here on ground control, the official podcast of the Winnipeg jets. We close this chapter of the podcast and we also close the future chapter of the 2020 uh variety in the future history books uh, that Beat definitely it. will be written about this so Beat 2020, 2020. <laughs> peace 2021 <laughs> let's go Yo! this is big ground control the official podcast of the winnipeg jets hosted by jets tv for jets news videos and more head to winnipegjets.com 